Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. This episode of Midnight Chats is a bit out of the ordinary for us. Normally we record these conversations in our office in East London. Sometimes Stuart or I, Greg, get out in the fresh air and take them somewhere else. But only once before, this time last year with Anna Meredith actually, um, have we recorded an episode in front of an audience of other real life people. Um, And what you're about to hear took place at this year's End of the Road Festival in Dorset at the start of September recorded at the more sociable time of midday on the Saturday on the piano stage, which is a stage in the woods at the festival, decorated like an old person's living room. Uh, It's actually very nice. And you can hear throughout the podcast uh, the birds tweeting in the background, so all very idyllic. And thanks to all those people who came to watch, listen and take part at the time on the day with your hangovers. Like I say, it was something different for us. I couldn't have asked for a more charismatic, interesting and inspiring guest for the occasion. Nadine Shah, who was playing the festival, joined me to talk about a whole range of things, from watching Lucinda Williams perform the night before, to her recently released third album, Holiday Destination. And to be honest, it's rare for an episode uh, to be both so entertaining and so poignant. It was really insightful stuff from Nadine. And along with it some great stories about the likes of Scott Walker, PJ Harvey and Jeremy Corbyn's new curtains. Um, but I'm not going to ruin it, that's all I'm going to say, And I, but I just hope you enjoy listening to it. If you do, please do subscribe or leave a comment, review, wherever you're listening. And a massive thanks again to Nadine Shah and End of the Road. This is episode 33 of Midnight Chats. <laughs> How are you doing, Nadine Shah? I'm all right. Yeah. Hanging on by a thread. Really? Not feeling too good? A little bit ropey. In fact, I played it quite... I was quite uh, safe last night in that I, I watched Lucinda play, who was one of the... I think it's one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. Actually, prior to watching her last night, I'd never even heard about her. So it was one of those things when you go to a festival and you find a real gem... Mm. And it's, it's very rare that we hear older women's voices in the music industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, what an inspiration she was. It was ace, but then uh, went to bed pretty early after that. But there was some party animals next door to me, and I felt like this grumpy old... I was like, keep it down, keep it down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, three hours sleep, but I'm um, hanging in. Yeah, and um, is End the Road one of those festivals that you would come to to go and check out? music that you're interested in because it can't be often when you go and pl- perform at these type of things it must be the case that you have to turn up you perform you leave but is it sort of end of the road Glastonbury style do you try and go to these type of places and come and hang out for the weekend yeah I mean I went to Glastonbury this year but it's to be it's not really a festival that I enjoy um I know it's the, the most famous one and but there's uh, I always find I have like a list of things that I want to see at Glastonbury and I see you know one out of 25 because it's just too big and actually I came to end of the road two years ago I played but I was only it was like an in and out job uh, like a bank robbery uh, I think it was like three hours and then out to another one but even those three hours I was like this is one I want to revisit mm. so I'm here the whole weekend and like yeah I discovered Lucinda last night mm-hmm. Uh, there's loads of bands that I want to see. Unfortunately, I missed Goat Girl. Okay. I really wanted to see them. But Lemon Twigs are playing after me mm-hmm. this evening. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing them. But I think it's a pretty special festival, actually. Like, the size of it is ace. Everyone's, oh, so accommodating yeah. in that you get people bringing you a <laughs> yeah, beer. While Because we're saying nice things. We should just keep saying nice things. <laughs> ah, I wonder if we can get this sound on the podcast. Yeah. Oh. oh, there you go. That's going to sound crisp, isn't that it? That is my favourite noise. <laughs> it's mine too. I think we might have a problem. Because I was pretty terrified because initially I thought this actually was a midnight chat. Mm. And I thought that would be quite funny for you guys. But 
I mean, I, I told my mother about it before I came. She'd like asked what the itinerary was, what I was doing. Mm. It's like, well, I'm going to play a gig. And then after the show at like at midnight, I'm going to have a chat. And my mother was like, no. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Yeah. Um, she so steps she'll into be, the sort of PR shoes and says, not a good idea. Oh, she says I've got the mouth of a fishwife. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, she's always pretty terrified. I can see her in the audience when I play shows and she's just like, "What? what? she's terrified about what I'm going to say. Um, she's very proud of me, my mother. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad this isn't midday, but I had to have like a hair of the dog and I'm glad I've got that in my hand now. I feel slightly less nervous. Yeah, I don't know what it's, what it's telling me. I've been brought a p- pint of water, so maybe I'm kind of like... <laughs> I mean, you're obviously a talented oh, musician, yeah, the, and I'm the artist. Oh, exactly, yeah. Yeah, living up to every stereotype. <laughs> um, you uh, you often go and see other bands, other people play live, which I think is interesting because um, when we speak to other artists, when we have other people on the podcast that we record like this, they tend to very much kind of concentrate on their own thing, and they might catch a bit of other bands playing or other artists performing at festivals or at their own gigs support bands things like that but they don't actively go out and go and see shows that regularly um you do how often do you go to a gig and why do you still kind of you know, outside of making your own music you're still really inquisitive about going to see like live artists yeah well i treat music as as a job in you know, but a proper job in that um it's my trade you know and uh, I don't know about you know whatever industry you work in or whatever it is that you do you want to be the you know the best you can be at it and I'm constantly learning but always inspired by so many other artists um yeah I don't go to as many gigs as say Big Jeff <laughs> have you does everybody know Big Jeff yeah well, Big Jeff's at the festival if he's not at my show I'll be devastated <laughs> like if Big Jeff's at, not at your show it's mm. just not worth playing yeah I went to see Kelly Lee Owens yesterday and he was down the front and I was pointing him out to friends and family that I was with and I was like, it's a, it's a good sign if you've got Jeff there. Yeah, he's, uh, well, he's, 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 you know, I, I, I love that man. He's a real beauty and he's one of the reasons we do what we do if you're a musician as well. And um, I, I just, I think he's um, a really great, great man. I love him. And, uh, but yeah, I, I probably go to about three to four gigs a week if mm. I can. Um I'm just I'm constantly learning from other artists. And I'm also trying to rip them off. I was going to say, do you go with a notepad? Yeah, well, not a notepad. Uh, but I just I, I want to see what other people are up to and just keep an eye on them all. Right. You know, and just making sure that Great no one's like stepping on me toes. <laughs> like, what's, what's he doing? I'm having that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm constantly going to gigs all the time, yeah. What was the last... Uh, mind-blowing show that you went to see that you still think about now last well the lucinda one last night was a pretty special one actually especially when it's something that you don't we have no prior knowledge to it and it's a real surprise apart from that what did i see last can't remember what i saw last oh i've been at um a few rough trade Mm -hmm. east um in-store shows and I saw Richard Dawson play. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Dawson's from my hometown as well. And I, I mean, like, I'm going to stop going to his gigs because it just makes me want to quit. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm never going to achieve that. Never. Mm. He's, he's um, I think he's he's very special. Yeah. Really. And he's, he's, uh, he's unique, you know. And I used to go and watch him back in Newcastle at, like, before he was like a name everyone knew, not even everyone knows him now, um, but I'd go and see him at like at house parties and stuff, he'd just like whip out his guitar. But normally if you're at a house party and it gets to that hour when someone rips out a guitar, you want to hit him over the head with it. As it's just, it's the most cringe-worthy experience. You're like, oh, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. When, Rich, uh, when Richard Dawson brings out his guitar, I think it's probably the closest thing I've ever had to a religious experience. Wow watching Richard Dawson play this powerhouse and his lyrics are just like, they're phenomenal. Like, he's a genius. He has a song called The Vile Stuff. And in that song, he mentions loads of people that like characters from Newcastle that I know and we've grown up with. And uh, he's just a very clever, brilliant artist. Mm. So probably Richard Dawson, actually. Excellent. He's just made it. So his latest album is called Peasant. So if anybody hasn't, checked him out it's a it's like a medieval concept folk record right yeah 
Um, I can't describe what it's about because all of his music's a bit too clever for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There'll be some article about it somewhere where he goes into great depth mm. about it. But um, it's it's a beautiful album. Yeah. You mentioned the northeast there. You're from South Shields. Um, tell us a bit about um, if if people. I mean, I'm ho- I'm hoping that lots of people here are kind of familiar with the Dean and the music that she makes. Um, but for those that aren't, like, tell us a bit about growing up in South Shields and your kind of family background and just how your, your sort of formative years of music discovery kind of took place. Has anybody here ever been to South Shields? Yeah. You have. Go, I recognise you. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Dave, how are you doing? <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, rough trade east, you were there. Oh, yeah, love, you weren't lying. I'd, I remember saying to you, like, you better come and see me. And you did. Go on. All right. Um, well, one person's been to South Shields. It's um, well a seaside town. Um, my mother was born in South Shields. Um, my father's from Pakistan. He came over to the UK. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong. I think it was 1971 mm-hmm. uh, from Pakistan. And South Shields is always actually like... What really grinds my gears is a lot of people, especially after um, the referendum, especially after Brexit, people pointing their fingers at the North East and saying, oh, because they voted leave, there was this mass assumption that, oh, I'm racist. And it's just not the case. In fact, um, it's a very diverse community historically in South Shields because it's a port town. We've had people from all over the world in and out of there. There's a huge Yemeni community. Um, Muhammad Ali got married in a mosque in South Shields. Uh, I wasn't there. <laughs> I don't know if I was born then. I don't know mm, if I'm going to no, lie about my so. stage age or not. If, I, if I'm going by my stage age, I definitely wasn't born then. <laughs> uh, but it's a really beautiful place. Um, I, I love it. I love going back there. But growing up there, boring. Pretty boring. But I think a lot of people find that with the places that they grew up. You have this... This time where, um, you know, a lot of people, you uh, you leave your hometown and you go elsewhere. And when you get a bit older, you get a little bit more, you get a bit more reflective on things. And uh, I love going back there. My parents live on, um, on the cliff tops overlooking the North Sea. And it's just kind of mind blowing when I go back. I forget. I mean, I used to hate it because I think there was this article in The Guardian or something. Uh, I was interviewed for a while back and it was about musicians that are from seaside towns and I was asking the journalist have you like is there like um have you when you've been interviewing people as there is there like a similar thing they're all saying is there anything which unites us all and he said well yeah everyone's saying how bleak it is mm-hmm. living in these seaside towns and that's for a few reasons and that I guess before air travel was so accessible and it was so cheap Uh, People would go to seaside towns on holidays and so lots of them are kind of almost like ghost towns now and you see a lot of, on the east coast especially, a lot of kind of faded glory, these grand, grand buildings kind of uh, a bit worn down. But I think there's also a lot of beauty to that mm, at the same charming, time. It's quite charming, isn't it? it yeah, you know, it's In quite charming. Yeah, but, it, but, charming. It, but it is, though, there is that. But um, I think that makes you want to leave because uh, there's just not a lot going on there. But uh, I love going back. It's amazing. Um, it's a place I might want to go back and make me home there. Um, which I never, ever thought I'd say. I've been in London for 15 years. Mm. And I moved to London when I was... I'm going to get me maths right. Uh, I think I was 17 when I moved to London. I'm 31 now. You do the maths. Um, <laughs> I'll just sing the songs. <laughs> Richard Dawson would know the figures straight away, the clever bugger. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've been in London for a really long time. Uh, and I love it, but I'm frustrated with it. Um, but it's where I, it's where I kind of cut my teeth in the music industry. Mm. And that's where I did all my slogging away at gigs. Mm was in London, not in the North East, because the North East was kind of dominated by male bands. Mm. And it was really hard to kind of get in that clique. A lot of them have embraced me now, which is lush. So I'm good friends with like Maximo Park, Field Music and all, and the Future Heads, all that bunch, and they're great. But at the time, it was just kind of impossible to get in that scene. Okay, why do you think that was? What, th- there was a certain closed-mindedness? This is only like 10 years ago, isn't it? I don't think there was a closed-mindedness at all. I think it just it just so happened that there were so many of these bands. They were just a bunch of mates, essentially, and 
I, I don't know. I get really frustrated with the music industry daily about how um, I think it needs to be a lot more inclusive in so many ways. And I don't think that the music industry at present properly represents how diverse this country is and who is making music. South Asian artists are definitely underrepresented. Female artists are unrepresent, um, unrepresented as well in that. And also we get, there's like loads of issues like um, the term female solo artist has become a genre, which is mad. So I'm getting compared to like Laura Marling all the time. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> I wish I was like Laura Marling, but I'm not. You just kind of get bandied in the same, in the, you just get kind of put in the same category and it's weird. Uh, hopefully it's changing. I can't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any signs of positive progress? Because we can talk about this in a bit, but you've been very, um, you've been like a passionate campaigner for you know, talking about mental health issues, for example, and also, you know, equality within the music industry. So do you see any signs in the time that you've been involved with the industry? I mean, you've made three records, been gigging for a long time, a decade more. Um, so have you seen a big change or not? Do you still think there's an, like, where are we on the scale? Because there's still an awful lot of progress to be made in your yeah. eyes. There's loads that needs to be done. Loads. How long we got? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Half an hour. Um, regarding mental health, and that's a really big frustration of mine. I think that there's a lot of responsibility, I think, lies within um, management companies and record labels. It's a pretty um, destructive industry. It can be. I mean, I remember my first tour. My best mate, Yasmin's here somewhere. Hey, yeah. Uh, but we went out, she came out on tour with me. I was supporting Shakespeare's sister. Okay. Uh, only one of them, though. <laughs> Siobhan, not the good one. And uh, no, I love her. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. What's the other one called? Marcella? No. What's the other one called? Marcella. Yeah, at the time, I think I was 20 at the time, yes, was I? 20, 21. About 10 years ago, innit? And people thought that I was Marcella. And I was like, wait, I'm 21 years old. When I, I was still kind of flattered, though, because she's a babe. Um, but that, I mean, I was just 21, first ever tour. And it was just me and my piano at the time, and my mate Yaz carrying the piano. <laughs> and uh, every night there was, like, my rider was just insane. It was like, uh, you know, a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of wine, and a crate of beer. That's not... <laughs> you should not be, like... You're, you're, the, the environment that you're in alcohol is so present a lot of the time mm. and there's lots of things I've had to learn over the past three years of how to make it a much more healthier environment to exist in otherwise it's just not it's not it's not sustainable and there's so many artists some really sad stories recently of artists that have taken their own lives in the past year and it's um it's pretty scary the figures and I think we need to we need to get rid of this ridiculous myth, this romanticism of the tortured artist. You know, I mean, look at what happened to Amy Winehouse. A lot of this would have been avoidable. But we, um, and I think uh, Amy Winehouse, that's, it's one of the most heartbreaking stories to date because she was such a talent. And in fact, I started out in jazz music uh, playing with Amy years ago in London. And it was one of the saddest days when she passed away, but everyone knew it was coming and it didn't feel like anyone was doing anything about it. But I've been going on uh, lots of panels and talking about mental health in the music industry and what can be done to improve it and to make it a, a healthier environment for artists to exist within. So at least the conversation's starting now. So I think it, there is a bit of progress there, but there's, like you're saying, there's still a lot, a lot to be done. What do you think, uh, what are those kind of things? Because you've got to look after yourself, but you also need to kind of build a network around you, presumably. That's people like your friend Yaz or yep. anybody that's close that, you know, you trust because um, you can go out on the road for months and months at a time and it's, 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 it's fun, no doubt, but also quite grueling. Um, so what are the things that you think, you know, what would your, your kind of recommendations be? Do you think it's important? You, you mentioned Amy Winehouse there. Um, Anybody who's seen the kind of Amy Winehouse movie documentary film will know that, you know, it's it's you can point fingers at certain people that maybe it looked like it's maybe kind of took advantage or didn't do anything. The inactivity of those things. So, what what are your kind of recommendations? Do you think it's just like make sure you're working with people who've got 
you know, that don't just purely have a business brain on them and thinking about the checks that are coming in and actually thinking about your well-being over that. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest revelation for me, which made a lot of change, was when I was just very honest about, uh, because I also have a mental health illness. Uh, It was never diagnosed. It's been years and years and years of different different things people have been saying maybe you've got this maybe you've got this and it now looks like I have oh it sounds really funny what's it called again borderline personality disorder which I just you know I I find quite funny and that but I find it um actually I'm it's a lot easier for me to discuss mental health when I inject a little bit of humor about it I try not to be kind of too jovial about the subject because it's very serious but it is a way for me to open the dialogue especially when I'm talking to younger people about mental health um as soon as I spoke to my management company about it they implemented little things like maybe after a show because adrenaline is quite a a dangerous thing it's addictive and it is quite destructive after a show I get this real adrenaline high and I'm working on now you've got to let it kind of dispel and I can't just be straight after a show I can't go straight to a merch table Um, got to have like about 20 minutes to just kind of come down let it like settle Mm -hmm. slowly um, little things like that, so my management won't book in press straight after a show anymore. Um, my touring team are all very aware of my mental health illness, and your touring team become like a little family. It's really nice. And my tour managers like me, mum or me dad, and my band are like my brothers or my sisters. You've got long tours and small vans. You've got to get on with them, and you can't hide anything on tour either. So there has to be this element of complete honesty. And I'm very unashamed in talking about my mental health illness. And I speak about it very publicly. I was very embarrassed about it for a long time. But I'm finding now that if I speak out about it, that's encouraging other people to follow suit, Mm -hmm. which is the first step to getting better and and kind of curating a healthy environment to exist within. Um, But just things like that, there has to be an open dialogue there from the start, which is... Yeah, a lot of it's up to yourself to do that. But as soon as anybody else in your touring party or your management company or your record label see any of these signs, they need to intervene and have a conversation with you mm. and allow you to have this conversation and, and be welcoming and understanding. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's maybe the, 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 the first step to it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk a bit about music. And mm. you mentioned that you grew up listening to a lot of jazz um, was that what was at home? And like, when did you? Um, was that like dad's record collection, or what, wh- where did where did like music enter your life? Now, nah, my dad used to listen to loads of um, Pakistani music, which I hated growing up. Okay, like really hated. Have you come round to loving that? I, I love it now. Yeah, like I'm obsessed with my father's music. Yesterday was um, we call it Pakistani Christmas in my house. Mm. It was Eid. Eid. Yeah, so Eid Mubarak, um, and. Uh, I, I did this radio show yesterday and I played loads of Pakistani music that my father played to me growing up that I used to hate. Uh, an artist called Mehdi Hassan, who's a guzzle singer, and it's just like insanely beautiful. It doesn't matter if you can't speak the language and you don't understand what's being said, it's just beautiful music. I urge you to go out and listen to some. If you let me DJ later on, <laughs> I might play some. Um, there was a lot of that growing up in my house, yep. uh, but never, I never embraced it. My mother, she like, she got a pretty cool taste in music. My mum, actually, she's pretty cool. Um, lots of like girl bands, like the Shangri-Las, mm-hmm. um, the Shirelles, and the Crystals. Mm-hmm. Kind of grew up on that, and I only really got into jazz music because I had this massive voice. And initially, I was like, my mum would put us in like uh, a real stage mother put me in loads of like competitions, singing competitions, and my go-to song was always Mariah Carey Hero. Whoa. Now I hear there's a karaoke tent <laughs> on site, and, and now there's a rule that if you're like a professional singer, you're not allowed to do karaoke, but I think you can bend that rule in that if you're a professional singer, you've got to do impersonations. So if you're there later on, I'm either going to do Mariah Carey Hero or Tina Turner, private dancer. <laughs> I think the latter is the, is the crowd's choice. Um, yeah, and then uh, my mum gave me a gospel record mm. and I joined a gospel choir and that was a really good place to, be, like, to use this massive voice that I had, mm. um, which was great. 
and then from there jazz isn't you know it's only like down the road and around the corner mm. so then started making jazz music not making but singing jazz music and that's uh how i started yeah. my kind of foray into music i've heard you talk a lot about your mum and your dad uh over the years and they sound <laughs> great but is it true that in a parallel universe somewhere you could have been the daughter of scott walker or Jimi hendrix aye okay I'm tell us to. about that <laughs> All right, so I look nothing like my mother. I'm not bigging myself up, but she is a total babe. Like, she's she's such... Um, everyone's mammy's beautiful. She's a really beautiful woman, like, inside out. She's, uh, she's kind of... I think she was taller than me when she was younger. Um, like, near and on, like, near six foot when she was younger, because with her Scandinavian heritage, tall, blonde beauty... And in South Shields, believe it or not, there used to be like a thriving music scene. And because of Chaz Chandler from The Animals, he was managing Jimi Hendrix. And so loads of great bands used to go through South Shields. Um, and my mum would go to these shows. Mm. But, you know, she didn't put out. And um, <laughs> loads, of these, like, loads of these rock stars would chat her up and she was too shy. Mm. So my mum, I could have been the daughter of Jimi Hendrix. So, and Scott Walker chatted her up once as well. And uh, she declined. Okay. Wow. I would have said yes. I still, w- <laughs> I still would. <laughs> Did you go to a show recently? <laughs> yeah. I went to a show. I still... Well, I had this... Like, I'm obsessed with Scott Walker. Like, I, I, I love Scott Walker. And um, I went to this show at uh, the Royal Albert Hall mm. recently. And there was a bunch of different artists uh, um, doing versions of his songs. I wasn't that enamoured by the show, actually. No, no it's I not very didn't nice hear music. great reviews. No, it wasn't. I think one of the problems with that show was that um, Scott Walker had... was in, There was an interview with Scott Walker mm. and Jarvis Cocker. And Jarvis Cocker had said to him prior to the show, um, do you have any advice for us and what we should do at the show? And Scott Walker said, yeah, just make it new. Because that's, that's why we're inspired by Scott Walker. I mean, he's still putting loads of us, me and my peers, like, to shame. Because he's making the most, like... Essentially, imagine, like, um, what's that band? One Direction. It's like that, right? The Walker Brothers were like One Direction, this boy band. And then Scott Walker is essentially... Harry, if Harry Styles went off and made the best, like, weirdest album, that's Scott Walker. That's what he did, essentially. Mm. And just kind of... I remember playing my mum some new Scott Walker. She was really surprised that I liked him. She was, well, let's have a listen then. So um, I played a, an album called Tilt, which is proper experimental. She was terrified and she was really angered by it. Like, hey, he doesn't sound very well. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, he's, mummy's fine. He's actually like one of the most innovative musicians in the world. She's like, well, I think it sounds like a racket. <laughs> and I was like, well... I suppose so, but I kind of like it. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so at the show afterwards, there was, like, a little bar down the road. There was, like, a bit of an after-show type thing. No one knew Scott Walker would be there. And he comes in, and I'm by myself downstairs, and he's in front of me, and I'm texting my mates upstairs going... And (laughs) my friend screenshotted and put it on the internet. And I was really drunk. I can't remember writing this. But I just wrote, Scott Walker is two metres away from me please come downstairs, and then capital letters, please help me. (laughs) Because I knew I was going to make a total arse of myself, because whenever I meet a hero, I I always muck it up. Um, So, yeah, I just went with the standard, like, I'm a Scott Walker, like, you changed my life. And And he just went, like, thanks very much, kid. Thanks very much. And walked off, and I was like, didn't tell us to bugger off, so that's a a plus. Um, Because PJ Harvey did. Oh, no. (laughs) I once uh, I bumped into. Can I carry on? Is that yeah, right? Please right. do. Um, I once bumped into. I was recording my second album, and we're recording it in South London. And uh, I was near London Bridge somewhere, on my way to the studio. And I was listening to PJ Harvey on the way, just so I could rip her off a bit. <laughs> and um, uh, on the way there, I saw her. And I was like, whoa, I don't know what to do. And so I just, oh, I'll just follow her. So um, <laughs> she went into like a, a shop and I was like, waiting outside the shop. I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this, it's going to be, it's going to be, we're going to be best mates. And she came out, I didn't say anything, I froze. She went to another shop. 
And I thought, okay, I'm going this time. I'm going, I'm going to get her. I'm just going to get her. And she came out, and I was like, didn't say anything. I was like, ah. Oh, yeah. Then she went into a, a, a dry cleaners, and she came out. And the first thing I said to her was just, PJ, dry cleaning, posh. Guy, <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm, I'm gutted. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, PJ Harvey thinks I'm really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, today, we're playing, uh, I'm going to plug the gig yeah. at the same time. We're playing at half four on some stage, the garden stage. The garden stage, yeah. And um, my regular sax, saxophonist, 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 <laughs> saxophon, ah, oh, whatever. Sax player. <laughs> yeah. My regular sax player, he has a prior engagement. <laughs> Um, but we've got Terry Edwards, who's PJ Harvey's um, saxophone player. He's playing with us. I'm not. I haven't told him my PJ Harvey story yet. Okay. I'm going to save it for maybe on stage. Yeah. No, no, I've done it now. You might get round two at some stage. Hopefully, you won't bump into her in like a waitrose well, or something. Well, she got on my train from Waterloo. We came here from Waterloo yesterday, and my mate Yasmin. You're getting a lot of shouts out. Oh, you're going to get shamed if I'm having it. You're having it. Um, <laughs> We were sat on the train waiting to come, where is it, Salisbury, Salisbury, as Yasmin said. Um, and we were sat on the train with our G&Ts, and uh, that, that's not relevant. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, we're sat there, and Yas just goes, oh my God, that lady looks just like Patty Smith. And I looked out the window, I was like, you dumb ass, it's PJ Harvey. <laughs> she looks just like Patty Smith. I was like, pfft. No, it's PJ Army. And then I thought, right, she's on our train. She can't escape me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a getter. So you're in the buffet car. <laughs> she's picked up a nice looking sandwich. I, did, I, just, I just didn't, though. I, I sat still. Actually, I just fell asleep. I was knackered. I think there's some photos of me like, <laughs> like that. But um, no, I haven't gotten any. I'll get her. I'll yeah. get her. Um, let's talk about Holiday Destination. This is the new album you just put out. And um, previous records of yours have often kind of um you've written songs about yourself and your relationships and and this time around holiday destination is a record about the state of things the world it's very uh, you're, you're looking outwards um did you where did that moment come that sort of transfer from writing more about kind of what comes from inside you and your kind of like private life to sort of looking out and being wanting to sort of comment on the world and the state of things uh, honestly, I think it was a <laughs> virtually impossible to write about anything else. Mm -hmm. um, my rubbish love life pales in comparison, you know. Um, I, I, I think it's. I also think it's like an artist's duty to document the times that we're living. My elder brother is a documentary maker. Mm -hmm. um, check out some of his films. He's called Kareem Shah, and so I'm really grateful to him. He's always opened me eyes to so many things happening in the world that aren't front page news. Mm. And he's, um, he's a really brilliant man. I'm very, very, very proud of him and, and what he does. And he was making a documentary for Al Jazeera and it was on the border of, um, of Turkey and Syria. And this is, f I think it's five years ago or four years ago. And uh, up until, the and it was in a place called Kilis. And he was in a refugee camp there. And this documentary was about the effects that the civil war was having on children. And whenever there's a war or any, um, any kind of dispute or anything in a country which is happening, and to see the effect that it has on children, they know they're, mo that they're completely innocent. And it's the, the most harrowing thing. Mm. And um, he was in a refugee camp uh, making a film about the kids there. And I made the music for it. And that was the first time I knew about this civil war. And I was pretty ashamed that I didn't know about it. But actually, I guess myself and a lot of us, we can be forgiven because it wasn't front page news. Mm. Um, and at that point, I knew I had to write about it. And in fact, it was my brother's encouragement. Um, <laughs> I won't say what he said. My brother's <laughs> encouragement. He's like, why don't you write some proper songs? <laughs> um, Thanks, bro. And uh, I was like, cheers, bro. Um, uh, no, I, I love him for it. Actually, I, he's, he'll always like if I get a bit, a bit like too big for me, boots, he always brings me back down the ground again. Mm. 
mm. and he reminds me of why I do what I do. He's he's a he's my biggest inspiration, my brother. Mm. Um, and so I kind of banked that that I had to make something. I had to make something good, and uh, and then it was front page news, and there were just the most harrowing images every day. They just they they just stain your mind, and they still haunt me every day. And that ah. Oh. Um, it's, it's a subject really close to my heart. Mm. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Oh, <laughs> um, oh awful, awful, awful. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. I think, like, I mean, anybody that hasn't checked out the collection of songs yet, it is, it's, it, it's a really um, deep and powerful, very personal piece of work. And I think that um, Nadine's just one of a collection of other artists, including other people that you've worked quite closely with, that have decided to kind of... Um, write songs about that kind of subject matter we're talking about the you know the 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 crisis in the immigration crisis in southern europe and and already just talked about there the syrian kind of civil war um people like abaro uh, otherwise known as ghost poet somebody you've collaborated with before yeah, he's ace. there are other it seems like a theme this year i've kind of discovered so many brilliant artists that are that have uh thanks <laughs> Oh, cheers. I've got a Kleenex and my snotty nose. For the record, somebody's just brought us another beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good job it's not gin. Imagine what I'd be like on that, on Mother's Ruin, just like... Oh. This is quite a gin oh. surroundings, though, isn't it? Um, well, it's like a Piers Morgan interview now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We might go to an ad break. <laughs> That's all right. He broke her. All right, I'm back in. I'm back in. I'm back in. Jeez, I'm sorry. Um, what a softie. I'm meant to be this tough goth. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's why we made the album, you know, it's just yeah. very important. And like you're saying, you've got, and actually it's lovely, like I was pretty scared to make a political album mm. originally because for a few reasons, like um, dividing an audience, because if you're ever going to have a political rhetoric present, not everyone's going to agree with you. And um, But it's so nice to have my peers making music about yeah. the same subject. So Maximo Park made a great album also about... Uh, the, the, well, the current refugee crisis, especially Syria, they were focusing on. But it's not just, when we're talking about the refugee crisis, it's not just Syria. There's Eritrea, Afghanistan, Sudan, so many countries. And it, you know, it's really sad to see. It's awful. But now that it's not front page news every day, there was a point when I'd finished the record and I thought, like, and this was an awful, like a fleeting, awful thought to have, but I was like, um, you know, what if it all gets sorted? This album isn't going to be relevant. <laughs> But actually, like, I would be the happiest person in the world if my album wasn't relevant and I had to go and write a, an album about my crap love life again. I really, I honestly, hand on heart, I, I wish I never had to make this album and I wish it wasn't relevant. But, like, the, most, the saddest thing, it's more relevant than ever because it's not front page news anymore and there's still people without homes. There's still people making that treacherous, treacherous journey every day and dying in the sea. And so we have to keep talking about it. You know, and we, we all still need to show our support and we all still need to keep donating our money or our time, whatever we can do. So I'm sorry if I sound preachy, but I am kind of urging you to go out and, and keep donating. There's some brilliant, brilliant charities. I'm working with one at the minute called Inara and they provide um, medical care for children who have been um, injured in, in war. And they've just got, they've done some amazing work or help refugees who are a huge organisation that work in so many different sectors, doing great work every day. So we've got to keep doing it. Yeah. Do you think now that you've sort of switched modes in your songwriting, so to speak, can you ever imagine going back to that style? Because there are always going to be things now, like, you know, I mean, hopefully you'll be the kind of artist that will go on and make 10, 20 albums. Like, there are always going to be things to talk about within the world. Now that you've tried out that style of songwriting, do you feel like you're always going to do that? No, because I cry in interviews all the time. <laughs> so uh, I'm, the next one's a dance record. Yeah. It's just pure gabba. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know. I guess like... Uh, it's yeah. hard to probably... You, you can't put yourself in shoes in two years' time or whatever. Oh, I th I've nearly finished writing the next album. Okay. And um, yeah, there's subjects in that. I'm talking a lot about gender politics and that a lot. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know really, but I guess I'm, because of what my brother said, it's kind of really stuck with me. Mm. And I think I'm never really proud of work, but um, I've never felt so happy uh, with them, um, or like satisfied is the right word, mm. with the piece of work that I've made 
other than this album actually because mm. I feel like it's I, I feel like it's kind of important yeah. a little bit We've probably got about five minutes left. What I'm going to do, I'm go, I've got maybe one more, two more questions left for Nadine, and then I'm going to ask if anybody else wants to ask a question. <laughs> um, we're super delighted that so many people have come, by the way. This is really great. Um, we talked earlier about your taste in music and like music discovery. In this, this autumn, you're going on tour, and you're going to take a punk band on tour with you, which I think is great, because um, they're a band called Life yeah. from Hull. They're kind of, there's a lot of fantastic politicised punk bands in the UK at the moment artists that we've enjoyed this year people like idols from bristol um life from hull shame they're playing either later today or tomorrow here at uh, end of the road you're going off on a uk tour but you've decided to frighten your audience with a band that play heavy punk rock sorry (laughs) well i i was talking to the lads in life they become like um me little brothers I, i love them and i'd said to them like come and support me on tour and they were like and i was like no no you know what the most punk rock thing you can do is not by playing with other punk bands. You know, don't play at your regular audience. The most punk rock thing you can do is come and play with me. Mm. In fact, the most punk rock thing they could do is support... I don't want to slag off any artists. <laughs> a so very it's a bit, a bit late for that. <laughs> oh, you haven't got me out of Walt J yet. Uh, They're regular listeners of the podcast. <laughs> I won't say what I've been saying I've been told off when I've been slagging them off. Um, I'm only joking, I actually like them, I just find it funny. Um, they're really lovely people. Um, yeah, that, that's what I was saying to life. I was like, support support people that you never normally would if you want to, because otherwise you exist within an echo chamber and they have a political message and they have something to say. Say it to everyone. Yeah, I find it funny saying we've got life support. <laughs> They're really hard to Google as well. The first time I heard them, I was like reviewing them on the round table at Steve Lamac show. And their song was called In Your Hands. So I just Googled like life in your hands and got loads of self-help articles, <laughs> which actually they were they're pretty, quite, pretty useful. quite useful, eh? Yeah. Has anybody got anything they want to ask Nadine? Did I meet Jeremy Corbyn? I've got a story about that. No, I didn't meet him on that occasion, but I've met him in the past. I'm a member of the Labour Party. Sorry if you hate them, but yeah. And um, I nearly quit music. Yeah, hey, yeah. Uh, there was a bef- after, was it during the last album or just after the last album? I kind of for a few weeks decided I was quitting music and I wanted to become an MP <laughs> for um, South Shields back home. And uh, so I started interning in Westminster. So I went to a few different like Labour Party parties <laughs> and big drinkers. And um, I'm only joking. But they, well, they all are, they're all pretty pissheads. But um, uh, I met Jeremy Corbyn a few times and his wife as well, who's super inspiring. And the work that she's doing in her home country is amazing. And I was at this one, it was like a charity, like a fundraiser for the Labour Party. I went to that. My dad has a curtain shop in the northeast. And it was in the northeast, this kind of Labour Party party. And um, my dad had donated a pair of curtains or like whatever you want, like to have some curtains made was one of the prizes in the raffle. And Jeremy Corbyn's wife puts her hand up and bids on it. And Jeremy's like, no, no, to her like, no, no, no. And she bids and she wins. So I think it's, um, we still haven't given them. I've got to go to Jeremy's house next week and measure his windows. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, this I'm going to embarrass is. myself like I did with PJ Harvey with him, aren't I? <laughs> Jeremy, swags and tails, posh. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to kind of wrap things up by saying a massive thank you to Nadine. Um, she's going to be performing later on today on the garden stage at half past four. So yeah. definitely go and check that out. That's all that's left for me to say uh, a massive thank you to Nadine, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thanks so thanks very, very much. much. Cheers, buddy. Thanks. Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Production by Emma Snook. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com. <laughs>